was required to treat them all as equals. Marry women of your choice, two, three, or four. But if you fear that you will not be able to maintain justice between your wives, then marry only one. The modern world has frequently come to view Islam as a male-oriented at best and misogynistic at worst. But in truth, Muhammad's teachings brought women new rights that would not be achieved in the Christian world for centuries. The first was the right to life. The Quran forbade the practice of female infanticide, which had been common in early Arabia. Women were also given the right to uh, an education, to be duly educated as men were, um, to inherit, which meant that they could buy and sell property, which again would mean that they would have to um, undertake business transactions. The custom of Muslim women wearing veils is mistakenly pointed to as another indication of Islam's prejudice against women. The emancipation of women was a project that was very dear to the Prophet's heart. There is nothing in the Quran about all women having to be veiled or secluded in a separate part of the house. This is a practice that the Muslims picked up three or four generations after the death of the Prophet. I feel that being a contemporary educated woman is far more in line with what the Prophet would have aspired for for a woman than what we've seen maybe throughout recent Islamic history. Muhammad had achieved enormous success. His followers had grown in less than 20 years from a handful to thousands of converts. But he could not complete his mission so long as the holy site of the Kaaba remained home to idols. In January of the year 630, Muhammad set out for Mecca at the head of an army of 10,000. As the Muslims approached the holy city, Meccan people made no attempt to resist. It was clear that the old gods of the Quraysh were powerless in the face of Islam. The Prophet had no desire for blood. He issued an amnesty as a symbol of his wish to unite all people as the children of one God. The only victims he sought remained sitting in the Kaaba. The Prophet entered the holy structure and proceeded to lead the destruction of all 365 idols as he recited the verse, The truth has arrived and vanquished falsehood. Muhammad had validated his vision and proclaimed to the world the force and vitality of Islam. By the time of his death, June 632, the Prophet had brought peace to Arabia. He had transformed a religion of many gods into a powerful monotheism based on a moral and ethical guide for daily living. But Muhammad's death was actually the birth of the great age of Islam. Within a hundred years, the words of the Prophet spread from Arabia to the world. As Arab culture mixed with Greek and Byzantine learning, an era of Islamic enlightenment brought enormous advances in mathematics, astronomy, medicine, literature, and architecture. Who would have thought today, let alone then, that a man who is described as born an orphan into a divided Arabian society, illiterate, a caravan manager, would create a religious tradition that within a hundred years of his death, its physical presence would spill out of Arabia, go all the way to North Africa and all the way over to India. And he always warned his followers not to make him into a Jesus, not ever to say that he was divine. He was just an ordinary man, he said. The fact that he led what we might call a normal life, I think, makes him very appealing to many Muslims, to most Muslims, perhaps, that he married, that he had children. These are all things, I think, that make him uh, very approachable as a model for people. So many centuries after it ended, Muhammad's life remains the foundation of the faith he founded. Today, it is the fastest growing religion on earth. As these worshippers respond to the ancient call for prayer, each looks to the Prophet's example to provide peace and serenity in their daily lives. The ancient Kaaba remains in Mecca, and millions of pilgrims arrive each year to retrace the footsteps of the Prophet. 
The site of Muhammad's ascension on his winged creature to meet God is today the Mosque of the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem. Muhammad's gateway to heaven has tragically become the focus of enmity and hatred between two peoples who trace their ancestry to the same beginnings. Some Muslims who partake of violence use the words of a compassionate man to legitimize their acts of cruelty and hatred. They cite verses of the Quran as inspiration for their monstrous ambitions. Since September the 11th, we've heard Osama bin Laden reciting some really blood-curdling verses from the Quran. But what bin Laden fails to do is to mention or recite the verses that in every case succeed these ferocious verses, which say, but forgiveness is better. If one wants to take one part of the story, uh, one of the chapters and, and, and develop a conception of the Prophet upon that single chapter, well, of course, it's going to be very distorted and the Prophet is going to be understood as a man of violence and a man of hate. When people commit violence and injustice in the name of Islam, they are committing violence and injustice against Muhammad and God. For peace to come to a troubled world, Muslim and non-Muslim alike will have to find a source of trust and acceptance of their common goals. One such source could be a better understanding of the life of Muhammad. Cleansed of the selfish motives that some terrorists wish to give them, the words of the Prophet remain to offer hope and optimism to a troubled world. Whosoever killeth a human being, it shall be as if he had killed all mankind.